This episode is brought to you by LMNT. Healthy hydration isn't just about drinking water, it's about water plus electrolytes. It makes sense, you lose both water and sodium when you sweat. Both need to be replaced to prevent muscle cramps, headaches and energy dips. But most people only replace the water. Why? Well, because since the 1940s we've been told to drink 8 glasses of water per day, thirsty or not. Drinking beyond thirst is a bad idea. It dilutes blood electrolyte levels, especially sodium, which leads to headaches, low energy, cramps, confusion, or even worse. This low sodium situation called hyponatremia is very common amongst endurance athletes, shift workers, and those who work outside in the heat, leading to thermal stress. The solution isn't to stop drinking water, it's to drink water plus electrolytes. This is where LMNT comes in. Just mix this flavor, electrolyte drink mix, into your water bottle and you're good to go. It's got no sugar or artificial junk, just electrolytes. LMNT has your electrolyte needs covered. Former research biochemist Rob Wolf and Keto Gains founder Tyler Cartwright and Louis Villasenor formulated LMNT to provide the optimal ratios of sodium, potassium and magnesium for health, performance and energy. They also formulated LMNT to please your palate. Many different flavors such as orange salt, citrus salt, watermelon salt and many many more just head over to LMNT to find out or better still go down to the show notes click on the link the sleep for performance link to get um, to click on this and get your free promotional pack where you can get a taster pack and no questions asked refund policy as well you don't even need to send it back so check it out at LMNT in the show notes Welcome back to the Sleep for Performance podcast. I am joined here today by the two Muppets from the balcony. If you've ever watched the Muppet Show, what's the, remember anybody remember their name? Do you remember? I got names? a Kermit. I got a no, Kermit. Mr. Uh, Frog. Two guys on the on the balcony. What was their names? Oh. The two Muppets. Uh, Oscar. Nope, that's no. the Grouch. The... Let's we have we'll have to Google this before we start. Muppets on the balcony. It was something like Chad GPT. I don't know why I'm saying Hector and Kosh. That's a ref, that's a that's a Stat, Statler and Waldorf. Do you not think they look like you guys? Have you ever seen them? No. Oh, well, these maybe. guys. What are we? What, which ones? From the Muppets. Oh man, they're you know, these some. two guys. Oh, you're you're too young. That. We are, are kind of curmudgeon-y, Jonathan. Yeah. We could we could play that role. Yeah, easy. <laughs> I think we I, two grumpy men. It's true. I think we have better hair. Although neither one of us has as good of a butt chin as that one guy. <laughs> Look at that. And that's wild. You might have to, you might, there you go. Might want to get that looked at. Yeah. <laughs> all right, the for first, Halloween, the, Jonathan. The first appeared on the Muppet Show in 1975, and the episode was called "Sex and Violence." Okay, we need to move on here before we get cancelled. Okay, <laughs> we are back today for our final installment, um, looking at this paper on sleep and performance with our friends Jesse and Jonathan. It's the Jesse and Jonathan Show. So last week. We finished off, uh, we were talking about competitive performance and travel and so on. And this week, we're going to uh, conclude the paper um, and we're going to look at common sleep problems in professional athletes. We're going to look at some training and travel factors in competition, which we've probably covered a lot already anyway. And then we're going to look at physical injury, electronic devices before we finish off with some strategy. So let's jump on to uh, sleep problems and, and this paragraph here, because this was, um, this was quite interesting. Jesse, can you, before we start, uh, before you jump into this paragraph, can you differentiate what a sleep problem is versus a sleep disorder? Yeah, definitely. It's, uh, I think, a really important distinction that is not well vetted or well disseminated to the general public. Um, so the way I like to describe it is that sleep problems are common and may not actually be real problems, so to speak. I expect sleep problems in my life and sometimes acutely on the short term. So a sleep problem could be uh, the occasional difficulty falling asleep or frequent awakenings during the night during a stressful period or a night or two where you're uh, having prolonged difficulty falling asleep because you're just a little bit more aroused or activated. Now, sleep problems are often 
a precursor or underlie some sort of sleep disorder. And sleep disorders have definable characteristics that cover not just the severity of a sleep problem, such as like, it takes me longer than 30 minutes to fall asleep, but also the frequency of the problem, meaning that more nights than not, I'm having this problem occur. That's when a sleep problem in turn becomes a sleep disorder. And there's definitely blurred boundaries there. People will make comments that if you score above a certain threshold on a questionnaire, you have a sleep disorder. Oftentimes that's in the context of insomnia with the insomnia severity index, but that's not really a great way to do it because the insomnia severity index is a subjective measure that doesn't also factor in the frequency of the occurrence. So sleep disorders are often, um, I think, overapplied from an actual diagnostic perspective in kind of the general public uh, and should be better served to have a trained clinician or physician or professional make the determination that you are experiencing a disorder. It doesn't mean you don't have a problem, but mm -hmm. it may not be a full disorder. Okay. So um, Jonathan, um, you work in the area of clinical psychology and you work with lots of people individually as patients or clients. How how would you explore this problem with people in terms of having a sleep disorder or a sleep problem? What sort of methodologies would you do to kind of uncover the difference between them? Because a lot, and the reason I'm asking this is lots of people go to me, if you do education sessions or a consultant to business, oh, I, I've got insomnia. I'm like, well, how do you know? Oh, well, I had trouble sleeping like on some, on Sunday nights. I have a, like insomnia on Sundays. No, that's probably because you got like social jet lag or you drank too much alcohol on Saturday or whatever it might be and you slept in too long. So how would you differentiate between these type of problems and disorders for people? Well, one of the biggest factor of variable for me, it's the <laughs> uh, daytime impairment. If, if uh, like Jesse mentioned very uh, beautifully, the difference between a problem and a disorder, if every now and then you have difficulty initiating sleep, maintaining sleep, or waking up too early, this does not uh, categorize as a sleep disorder. Maybe a sleep problem, and then it will be on the daytime dysfunction. If every time you're having difficulty sleeping and this occur on a set pattern, then this will be uh, considered a sleep disorder. However, if it is a set pattern that you can name the external trigger, because you can name the external trigger, it's not a sleep disorder, it's a wakefulness problem. Mm. Uh, like you mentioned, every Sunday I have difficulty falling asleep. Well, then why do you have uh, difficulty falling asleep every Sunday or every Tuesday? Because this is when I this is when I teach or whatever the reason may be. But if you are able to name the trigger that prevents you from having a good night of sleep and this is accompanied by daytime dysfunction, then you'll have to juggle between that sleep problem and sleep disorder. But to me, the most important factor is that daytime impairment. Yeah. And, Je and Jesse, in the paper, um, quite alarmingly in this paragraph, actually, we see some extremely high rates of problems. A lot of people think when we see a, a you know, a fit and healthy, what would say a fit and healthy, which I think are two separate things. But when we see a fit, young, athletic person that they would have no trouble with these issues. But we see like you got rates here of like 68 percent of professional soccer players, you know, having poor sleep quality. You got over 38% having poor sleep quality again as measured by the PSQI. And obviously you just articulate the limitations of questionnaires and so on. Um, you got 31% then of, of others not getting enough sleep. Um, you know, a lot of people then we would have seen in our own work as well, not getting the recommended seven to nine hours of sleep per night. This this seems to be quite surprising and quite high. Why do you think this is so bad, really? It's definitely multifactorial. Um, it's certainly alarming, I think, is a word that comes to my mind, as you were alluding to there. It is really shockingly bad in an area where performance is prioritized, right? These individuals are either, they're professional athletes. So there's a lot of, as you pointed out, the healthy elements that we would assume are or unhealthy elements that we would assume are contributing to sleep problems in the general population, not necessarily prevalent here. And in turn, oftentimes there's medical staff or support or efforts to address these issues. So why is it so hot? Right. Um, that to me 
is an intersection of one kind of the personality traits that we often see in athletes in general, who may be very high strung, motivated, perfectionist, things like that, that will contribute to some difficulties with sleep at times, or often we see those associations in the scientific literature. But it really is about the demands that these athletes have to face when it comes to the timing of performance or the timing of competition or the timing of training, those things happening late at night, that's going to lead to some pre-sleep arousal that's going to make it very difficult to fall asleep. And thus, you're going to capture insomnia characteristics. Doesn't necessarily mean they have insomnia disorder, but they may score high enough on the insomnia severity index where you get like a 38.6% of the sample eclipse the threshold suggesting moderate or clinically significant insomnia. Similarly, some of it's measurement based. As we've pointed out with the questionnaires, it's a lot of limitations here. I mean, Jonathan, I almost want to pass the microphone to him on this one because he has a soapbox upon a soapbox upon a soapbox prepared for this discussion. Uh, it's like the rusting Russian nesting dolls of soapboxes for this one, if you will. Um, but more or less, like the Pisky is a highly flawed measure, and basically it's universally leveraged that scores above five suggest poor sleep quality, but it's really not hard to get a score above five. And does that really suggest poor sleep quality all the time? Probably not. So it may just also be an overestimation of the magnitude of the problem. Hmm. Um, so measurement contributes, the elements of training and competition contribute. And then we've talked about the mental health stressors these individuals face as well. Um, and so similar to the pre-sleep arousal, anxiety, worry about historical performance, about injury, ability to train, about future performance, these things are going to negatively contribute to one's ability to fall asleep, stay asleep, and their sleep quality. And then the last factor is, although people are really healthy, right, we see high rates of sleep disordered breathing in athletic populations most saliently in, say, professional football, or I guess American football, but also rugby as well. And largely that's because these people are really muscular. And so you get these really, really like large necks. Um, you'll often see that kind of trope, that defensive lineman, the def defensive end, who is probably the best athlete on the field in American football from a speed power perspective. But I would arbitrarily throw out that like, 75% of defensive ends probably have sleep apnea. And it's largely just structural in that sense. It's mm -hmm. not that they're unhealthy, but it's just the way they're built. And I know that Jonathan's group in Canada is doing a lot of work with adjusted neck circumference as the strongest predictor for sleep apnea relative to some other measures. And I think that is really relevant here. What do you think, Jonathan? Well, there's a big distinction to be made, with, especially in, in professional athletes, between being fit, as Ian mentioned, and being healthy. I definitely do not think that professional athletes represent a healthy population because of all the uh, outlier that we see. I'm going to take uh, track and field, for example. You went with American football, and then I'll go with track and field, eating disorder behavior. We see that a lot, but yeah, when you see these athletes walking down the street, man, they, are they ever fit? Therefore, they are healthy. Our concept of who is fit means it is healthy is flooded. And it will go for the same way for the American football player and the rugby player with these uh, very large neck. So is it because structurally they're super massive and they have sleep apnea? Are they considered unhealthy? Then it goes into the definition of what healthy and unhealthy means. And to just go back to the uh, high prevalence rate of poor sleep, unfortunately, I do think that the PISCI is a massive, massive overestimation of poor sleep. And unfortunately, it is widely used, I think, it has some merit uh, to be used in athletes, but if it is appropriately used for certain metrics. Having said that, I do agree that an insufficient sleep is too prevalent among that population. And what I think, and this will be this will require a qualitative paper, is that we don't pay attention enough to bed uh, bedtime revenge procrastination. 
their entire day, if not their entire year, is scheduled to the minute. Except that 30 minutes before bedtime, where they can do as they please. Mm. And even if, and then this is when electronic device will come in. And this is when the late show will come in. And this is when the, well, I'm just going to lay there for a couple more minutes watching something, reading something. And then they end up at below seven hour. So this concept of LT, unhealthy, uh, sleep problems, sleep disorder, sufficient, insufficient sleep, uh, require more research. Even though it is observational research and not a intervention, I think we we're, we are ready to do some intervention, but we don't have the entire uh, puzzle here. We have some pieces, and now we need to put them all together and see where we uh, would uh, have the best impact. It's it's um. An interesting point there you raised, Jonathan, and just for people listening, when we were talking about the PISCI, it's the PSQI, the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index. So it's a sleep quality measure that's um, self-reported and it has limitations in terms of like, if you have a, if you ask that questionnaire on a Monday morning and someone's had a bad night's sleep on the weekend or they've been out partying, then it's just indicative of how they feel that day. So it's difficult unless you got like as a repeat measure over time. Or if someone's doing it because they think their job depends on it or depends on the, the coach wants an outcome or whatever goes on, like it, it can be flawed in that respect. But I think, John, the new raised an interesting point there about this time before bed, because you see this in non-athletic populations as well. The middle-aged family that, put, that comes home, gets the kids ready, has dinner, plays with the kids, bath time, whatever. The two parents sit down. And like maybe catch up on some emails from work, some other stuff. And it's like, right, we'll go to bed shows you up at five or six in the morning. And they're just lying there looking at their phones because it's like the only half an hour to get to themselves. So you can empathize with people as well. It's a bit, bit like, like you said, Jonathan, every minute of their day is scheduled, if not the year. So in some ways, like what's the trade-off between just trying to go to sleep really quickly, but you might have more procrastination and increase in time of falling asleep like sleep onset latency, or what's the benefit of giving some pe- time to some people just to kind of mind wander mindlessly for half an hour? And this is where we might actually just jump. We, we should just maybe jump to like trying devices here because sometimes the ability to jump on Instagram and have a laugh and watch a funny cat video or watch someone falling over or someone getting a slap in the face or to be able to message your friends to make sure everything's okay, especially when there's time zone changes, you know, so it might might be difficult to ring. What's the benefit of that as opposed to how it may impact your sleep? So we'll probably just jump down to that electronic device um, paragraph there, Jesse, and, and talk about what we found there in regards to electronic devices, because I'm I'm not sold on electronic devices has such a negative effect as people say it personally, from what I've seen. So I'm interested to know what you think from looking at the data. Yeah, I, I fully agree with you that it's it's uh, it's complicated for sure, but that we've in many ways, demonized um, screens, electronic devices, probably more than we should have mm. uh, in the field to the point where it's become, it's created potentially some sleep problems due to a kind of orthodoxical tendencies around these devices. Oh my God, I got hit with some light at night. That means I'm not going to sleep well at all. Right, exactly. Um, the reality is, uh, I think there's some good work being done by, I think, Chuck Seisler's lab in general about resiliency to uh, light exposure at night based upon kind of your light exposure across the day and stabilizing your circadian rhythm and all sorts of things like that. So there's going to be no universals about whether light at night or screen uses at night is poor. But I think you bring up a really, really important point, which is quality of life. And as a training clinical psychologist myself, I'm a huge believer in kind of the humanistic experience. And there is, I don't know if we can distill this down scientifically or if the data exists, but I think it really is interesting of like, well, ideally I'd rather have you sleeping seven and a half hours of quality sleep. That would be optimal. But if the two options here are you get seven hours of sleep but it takes you 45 minutes to fall asleep and you feel extremely distressed about it versus you spend 30 minutes to an hour delaying your bedtime, enjoying uh, some texting with friends, watching something that's funny or whatever it may be that provides you some happiness and contentment. 
and you only get six to six and a half hours of sleep, but it's continuous and you're not distressed by it and you Mm -hmm. appreciate it. I don't know where I'm going to draw my line in the sand, right? I don't know which is technically better. I don't know that we can really vet that out scientifically short-term and long-term. Yes, we know that greater than seven hours per night for most humans is necessary for to stay within your healthy range of short and long-term outcomes from a health perspective. But again, what about that element of distress? And I think that's what we're getting at here is, is how do we send that message also though, without giving people the full freedom to just delay their bedtime continuously. Right. Yeah. Cause once you open the door a little bit, people may pull further. Um, So I haven't really talked about what we found in the, in the literature, but that's kind of where I land as far as this, do I demonize screens? Do I force them to sleep or do we let you kind of gradually land your plane for the night in whatever manner you find most comfortable, which is most likely going to lead you to having the best opportunity for good sleep anyways. So Um, I I think this comes back to a bit like education and maturity as well, Jesse, whereas like, you don't, you know, you don't say to people, it's it's interesting because like, with alcohol or caffeine as well, people have, have kind of started to get that message around with sleep, but not with electronic devices. And I think because electronic devices do so many different applications, it's not like it's 1985 when we pick up a landline and we have a conversation with someone or we're reading like the New York Times in bed, right? People have done these activities before sleep forever. They've read before bed, they've socialized, they've talked, they've jumped on the phone, whatever it might be, they sent telegrams, whatever it might be, sent a, pig- a carrier pigeon, whatever was going on, there was always something going on before bed, right? So people even like Theodore Roosevelt used to write into like two and three o'clock in the morning. So people have always had bad pre-sleep routine for some reason or another. The other thing is what I find with electronic devices is the conversation around what's clinically relevant and what's statistically relevant. And this is the problem that goes on as well, is that people start using stats. And then we get these big gray headlines in the paper, electronic devices, you know, delay sleep. But the control group and the um, intervention group, it might be in difference of 15 minutes. But does that manifest or does that carry on to sleep duration? Like what you were saying, is the quality of sleep better? And these are the conversations or the studies are not looking at this. And the other thing that we don't look at as well is in regards to the time at work the next morning, because this may have a more significant factor than anything. Now, we did a paper a few years ago. I'm not sure. I don't think it made it into your lit review because you seem to eliminate my papers for no reason. But um, I think it's something got to do with racism or something. I'm not really sure. Um, I think it's because I'm Irish Catholic. You just want to vilify me but anyway we'll talk about that later on um jordan peterson will be uh giving you a call um people are listening to this going is he serious it's a joke people it's a joke <laughs> <laughs> but anyway we did a study a few years ago in elite judo athletes at the australian institute of sport where we actually took devices away from one group and left one group with devices and we did it for a period of 48 hours during a training camp and when they came out of the training camp there was no difference between sleep duration between two groups. And the biggest factor there was, and of course, the local papers here in Australia were like, oh, electronic devices does not affect sleep. No, 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 don't cherry pick, read the paper and read the abstract and listen to what we said. It's not the fact that electronic devices didn't have an effect. It was that the time at wake the next morning was, was truncating the sleep opportunity. And that was the biggest factor. So people were getting woken up at six o'clock in the morning as young athletes an average age of 18 to go training which may have been affecting their total sleep time because of their chronotype being more of an owl chronotype as well. So we demonized electronic device on one end, but we're not thinking about it in a holistic framework as well. And this is where I think we kind of get fixated on electronic devices. But because I've worked with athletes one-on-one, they don't fall asleep till half two in the morning. And they're on their, they'll tell me they're on their phone for an hour beforehand because they like watching stupid stuff on YouTube or whatever. But then they sleep in because there's no training the next day or no game. They'll sleep until midday. So that athlete then has got like nearly the guts of 10 hours sleep. Should I be happy? Or should I be like, no, you should go to bed at nine o'clock and get up at five o'clock in the morning and be like this and be like Mark Wahlberg. Like, so what, what, what's, what's the best outcome here? It's hard, isn't it? To to work out what's best. Yes. It's definitely very complicated. I'm going to pass over Jonathan here in a second, but I, I mean, I just, you know, I think the, the key take home here is there's no universal and The context matters, the relationship you have with the electronic device and what you're using it for matters greatly. You know, there's a huge difference between 
sitting technically listening to a podcast is yeah. is an electronic device, right? Correct. Yeah. But there's a huge difference between that and scrolling aimlessly through Twitter, which is very negatively charged more times than not, or social media that's go that's how I said it, that's going to leave um maybe an emotional distress or an emotional charge that's going to disrupt sleep. So it really is also about the content, not just like how much screen time are you using, which is generally how these studies are performed, right? Mm-hmm. Is how much screen, how much are you on your phone before bed? Well, what if I'm on my phone, uh, you know, watching flowery videos about people sleeping really well? I don't know, like sending very yeah, yeah. positive thoughts to the brain about sleep versus like watching Game of Thrones and people getting their heads cut off. There's a whole different effect on the physiology. And yet we don't we don't break it down to that level in science. We haven't yet. Um, so I think the devil is in the details and we shouldn't demonize it, but we should better understand it. And in fact, mm-hmm. we should probably leverage it through whether that be meditations or sleep stories yeah. or whatever yeah. can help people drift into their peaceful state to find contentment. Um, but I think you're dead right. All joking aside, I think there is different ways to leverage it. And I think we see that happening with meditation apps like Calm and all these other things that are happening. And people listen to these stories, they do meditation to go to sleep. There's lots of stuff on YouTube. I think you're right about the podcast. People have listened to radio for a long, long time and it's not been a problem. But we seem to like, oh, we listen to a podcast. That's electronic device, but that's bad. It's like, wait, no, well, a radio is electronic device too when you listen to that. That's, that, that's okay. Like, what's the why is one loud not 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 the other like it's it, it's kind of this weird like you said it's a relationship with the phone um so it's bizarre yeah i think yeah definitely needs more work well and the shameless plug here for a research study that i brought on the sleep research study sleep research study podcast which was uh dr christine bloom's work looking at the effect of light acutely at night on melatonin production mm-hmm. And in turn, the downstream effects on the night of sleep um, related to the melatonin suppression. They saw that the melatonin was suppressed by the light, but acutely it did not have an effect on the sleep quality objectively or subjectively. Um, So I think we overemphasize it, which in turn creates distress. And then we create the sleep problem. Doesn't mean don't be mindful of these factors, but don't be rigid. Yeah. Yeah. Jonathan. Well, I think there's a there's a place where to use the electronic device. So as Jesse mentioned, <clears throat> yes, we put too much emphasis on don't use it, don't do this. And again, we we talked about this on the previous episode. Uh, we tell people what not to do, but we don't tell them what to do. So in terms of electronic device, I don't think the electronic device is the uh, the uh, demonized uh, thing. I think it's the light that we are trying to uh, shield ourselves from. So for example, a podcast, audiobook, or uh, any of these activities, I have no problem with it. What I do have a problem with with my patient is if you have enough energy to scroll or watch, therefore you're not sleepy. If you're not sleepy, you Mm -hmm. should not be in bed in the first thing. I really like that. I always give the same, same joke and the same example, which is, do you ever go sit at a table waiting to be hungry, which is no. So why are you in bed waiting to be sleepy? So if you want to scroll or watch, go on your couch. And then as soon as you feel the sleepiness, so that also will raise the awareness between tired and sleepy for the patient, then you move to bed. Once this uh, educational piece is done from the tiredness versus sleepiness, and you made your point with that anchor in the morning, then you can work very well on the schedule of electronic device. So you're not withdrawing the electronic device, you're just giving them a schedule on which they can actually use their electronic device, and then they don't have that stress of, oh no, it's nine, it's 10, it's 11. No, you plan for it. You know exactly when you're gonna need it or use it, and then work accordingly. So this is more a question of when and where. If you are to use it, not in bed, you protect your sleep environment as much as you can. You want to use it longer, though. Sure, I'm all into sleeping in the morning, but I'm giving you 60 to 90 minutes, no more than that. So there's Mm -hmm. no sleeping until midday because then we just sabotage the entire sleep homeostasis. So that bedtime revenge procrastination has a very big educational piece to it, which is, again, where can you use it? When can you use it? 
And how long are we talking about? Are you dumb scrolling for two hours or are you dumb scrolling for 15 minutes? Are you listening a podcast? Are you listening an audio book? Are you listening a, medita- a guided meditation app? So all of these things matters. And at the end of the day, as you mentioned, I don't think the electronic device is a bad thing. Pretty much like AI, we need to work with them. They are a good tool if you use them uh, adequately. Yeah, I yeah I agree. And um, the other the other component in this in this area here is um, nutritional habits or factors. And um, this is one that gets a lot of airplay in terms of discussion about, you know, go ketogenic, go carnivore, go vegan, go low carb, go this carb, go up and down, go protein. Like there's, it seems to be a, it, it's look, it's been going on since probably, I don't know, since, since ever, like it, when I was growing up, like all our parents were going to Weight Watchers and doing the Atkins diet and all this sort of stuff in the eighties and the nineties. So like, we've always seen something, um, occurring in this field there's always been a flavor of the month and of course people get like religious zealots about it um and then you know this has this works for everybody and there's no sort of, sort of intervention uh, no sort of individualized individualization of a in terms of nutrition did you find any relationship here with sleep in any shape way or form with excluding alcohol and caffeine because we know we, we've kind of spoken about those ad nauseum on this podcast and that's been well you know, depicted in the literature, but other than alcohol and caffeine, was there anything else that we, we were able to see with this? Yeah, it's very high level at this point, Ian, and, and ignoring athletes, just the field of sleep in general, hasn't, it's still in its infancy when it comes to considering the effects of not just dietary composition. So what you're eating, whether that be the type of macronutrients and micronutrients, and the quality of them, but also the timing of them as well. Uh, so it's it's not just the diet you're subscribing to, but when you're eating them. The only real recommendations we currently make in universally in the field of sleep is to not have big meals before bed and probably to avoid high sugary processed foods before bed. Um, the big meals before bed is largely based upon the notion that digestion requires wake. It's a wake behavior. So it requires wake <laughs> biology. So having a big meal, it, you still may be able to fall asleep because your homeostatic drive is really high. You still may be able to stay asleep as well. Your circadian rhythm and homeostatic drive are in line, but your sleep quality may be poorer because you're not able to reach the deeper stages or stay in the deeper stages because the there's more active wake biology. And there's limited translation to the athletes at this point, but we did find, I think, at least one paper that noticed that there's a delay in meal timing when it comes to athletes. And that makes a lot of sense because they often have late competitions or late trainings that require a non-traditional eating schedule. And so you're requiring them. And at the same time, these are individuals that are expending a ton of energy and are also needing to recover. So they have unique nutritional demands at the same time, whether it's protein intake or whatever it may be to assure the possibility to train and perform the next day as well. Um, And often that leads to probably, I imagine athletes backloading a lot of food prior to bed. That's going to degrade sleep ability and quality. And that's what that study showed is that there was a delay in meal timing, particularly in the context of competition that coincides with self-report lower sleep quality and sleep duration. Um, and I'm not surprised by it. I think it makes a lot of sense. It's a complicated space, but it's one that we really need to spend a lot of empirical attention to. Yeah. Yeah. There's Dr. Ellis uh, from uh, Newcastle working with, I think, uh, Rohan Doherty. Yeah, Rohan. They're doing, yeah, a lot of, yeah. they're doing a lot of work on cherry tart juice, which allegedly will increase your melatonin and improve your sleep. So as Jesse mentioned, I think we, <clears throat> in terms of what to eat in order to improve our sleep, we're not there yet, but we definitely see what happens when we don't sleep properly is our uh, cho- uh, food choices are, are changing. So example, if you're, if you're sleep deprived, you're more likely to eat chocolate and, 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 and transform food versus uh, a, a fruit and veggie. So that we know. So the, those short sleepers will have a higher likelihood of, of uh, going out for poor ch- uh, food choices versus the uh, adequate food choices, but in terms of improving uh, sleep quality in the uh, realm of athletic performance, yeah, we're not there yet, unfortunately. Soon though, and I do believe it will go through chrononutrition. 
the timing yeah. of the food will be uh, governing everything. Yeah. Yeah, and um, we've had Ronan on the podcast before. Ronan's from Donegal in Ireland, and um, he recently finished his PhD and presented, I think, on our Steep for Performance seminar last year, the year before. So I've had Ronan on as well discussing this, and it's definitely an area which needs a lot of attention. And there's lots of crazy stuff out there. Recently, we found actually in an industrial setting that um, some people were recommending that you um, boil or stew banana skins and then drink that juice that would help with sleep. Melatonin. It's supposed to create or help your release of melatonin. The banana, the kiwi fruit, and the uh, cherry tart juice, if I'm not mistaken. I think it's one of those paper by Rowan Doherty and uh, Jason Ellis. But I don't know if this, they spoke about boiling bananas. I don't. I remember I they spoke. I, 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 I know Rowan spoke about kiwi fruits and cherry tart, but I don't think he said about... Boiling, boiling bananas and drinking the juice off of that like that's that's filthy I ain't doing that I don't care if it's releasing steroids into me I am not boiling a banana skin and drinking that juice that's disgusting <laughs> well I mean you know I, I dropped a paper in the chat for the two of you it's one that I've been aware of for a while I think it's Meng and colleagues it's the colleagues um, dietary sources and bioactivities of melatonin from 2017 and one of the things I love about it and Jonathan you left off my favorite potential natural source of melatonin, which is the pistachio. And it actually computes that if you, a standard serving of pistachio is like three and a half grams or whatever it is, um, translates into generally about two to three milligrams of melatonin. Now, the bioavailability of that is the complicated aspect. Mm. Is that the same as a synthetic melatonin that you're taking, whatever it may be, but they're naturally rich. We just don't know what it's doing, right? Now, personally, I eat a lot of pistachios at night and I convince myself it aids my sleep. Um, but this is one of those studies where it literally says on average, like 230,000 nanograms uh, per gram of melatonin in a pistachio. And that again, when you translate out is about two to three milligrams. So again, it's an area that I'm surprised we haven't spent more time on, but I'm also not surprised because who pays the bills in our capitalistic world? And that's the pharmaceutical companies. So I know. This podcast is brought to you by Pfizer. <laughs> <laughs> we'd like to remind, but I mean, the, the we'd times, like to remind you that they... the views of Jesse Cook are not representative of this podcast. <laughs> it's true. Uh, we're not sponsored by pistachios either, but Jesse is. Um, I will say, I think the landscape is changing. You know, there, a salient example is uh, Lamar Odom. Uh, you know, there's a lot of complicated issues related to Lamar Odom in general, but he's on record stating that he was eating like 10 to 15 candy bars a day, uh, just standard practice as a national basketball association player. And, Oh yeah. Over the last, like, I think six years or so, there's been an evolution where like dinners prior to games and the food spreads that these teams get are a lot different than where they were, where it's now more focused on, uh, I wouldn't call them healthy options. Like I think the Milwaukee bucks have like a, the most elaborate like peanut butter and jelly spread you could ever have. Um, so maybe not the healthiest things in the world, but better options. And so we're moving in that direction. And we see that too. When we got to the, you know, we skirted over it a little bit in the sleep problem section, not everything's negative. Hmm. There's actually like more data these days. Cause Jonathan and I's review is only focusing on the last five years. And it wasn't all negative. There was a lot of like over 50% of our samples actually achieving sleep duration of sufficient duration. So that to me suggests that the athletes are at least progressing. It's still, we've addressed that there's these caveats that throw wrenches into lifestyle habits that are likely to have negative influence on sleep that we need to better understand and develop some strategies around, which is probably maybe about like barriers to training and things like that. But uh, I think there's movement, momentum, which is encouraging. What do you guys think about, and I know this isn't in the paper, but it's just kind of a side note. What do you guys think about um, many people self-reporting the um, significant increase in, so significant decrease in sleep combined with a significant, resulting in a significant increase in daytime performance 
mental clarity and basic overall health uh, outcomes when people are going to ketogenic or carnivore diets. There is lots of information on this, but very few scientific studies using objective sleep. And I know many, many people that have had massive benefits on it, particularly those people with IBS, Crohn's, other gut issues like that. And so I don't know whether it's mainly that they've removed predominantly processed foods and, you know, other sort of things like lectins and, and you know, um, gluten and so on. So that's why they're feeling so good. Or is it is there something else going on here? And um, and uh, is that contributing to their 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 sleep, their less sleep drive? Because it would seem to be that people are feeling less sleepy. So this might be a kind of an intertangled question here about th- can food actually make you feel the type of food or the quality make you feel groggy and have an effect on your sleep pressure, which I've not seen before. But I'd also say as well that when I've been on a couple of silent meditation retreats, my sleep need goes down as well. And I often wonder, is it the type of food that we're eating? Plus the other big one, which is stress. And if we can manipulate those two variables, does our actual sleep need go down? So does the seven to nine hours not really you know, is that really not what we require because this is kind of artificially increased because of all these other stressors in terms of food and life on us? That's a bit of a weird, big question though. So, yeah. (laughs) Well, I think if you pay attention to your your food, especially in those patients that have IBS or gut problem, Crohn disease, you're you're talking about a uh, inflammatory, uh, unfortunate individual. And if you remove that inflammation, you're decreasing substantially their pain, and then you're decreasing substantially their stress throughout the entire day. And now they are enjoying their day instead of trying to battle their way through. So now, pretty much like a kid, when you're trying to put a kid to to sleep, you're withdrawing him from his fantasy world. Whereas now that person is almost relieving these kind of things that Oh, look at this. Wakeful time is actually enjoyable. Enjoyable. I can do more and more things because I'm not always uh, depriving myself from A, B, C, and D. So that sleep drive may be decreased because of the absence of stress, as you mentioned, and also the absence of inflammation in their gut. And I do believe there's not enough research, or maybe I'm not aware of all that research that is being done between that gut uh, relationship to stress and sleep but definitely an area that could be expended. Yeah, how much time do we have, Ian? Um, this is a can of worms that I'm really excited about. Uh, not in the context of sports specifically, but a pathology that I'm very interested in, which is idiopathic hypersomnia or hypersomnolence disorder, which is the DSM-5 classifier. But basically people who are excessively sleepy without any sort of medical or psychological explanation for it no insufficient sleep, no sleep continuity issues, things like that. And so I've done a lot of research on my own, just trying to better understand how diet, meal timing, all these things, the various dietary patterns can influence one's sleepability and quality and their perception of, or rather their daytime functioning, their vigilance, their cognitive functioning, their energy levels, things like that. From a high level picture, I think you're spot on that in most situations, the carnivore or ketogenic diets in the context of energy and sleep quality and so on from the anecdotes we're hearing is probably largely driven by two factors in my brain. One is, as you pointed out, the removal of the processed foods, the sugars, those types of things, but it's also the positive expectations of any sort of habit change, right? You're putting effort into your well-being that in turn generally means you feel better day in and day out. People show up to therapy, even if they're not doing anything, they feel like they're doing something. Naturally, their depression seems to disappear, right? Without massive changes, not always the case, but more times than not, there's a bump there. Yet, I still am concerned that the radical adoption of these extreme dietary habits over the long term is going to have negative influence on sleepability and quality through a physiological pathway, such as like serotonin production or things like that. When you're removing carbohydrates, you leave yourself potentially vulnerable. Now, I understand that by saying that the feedback and the comments from the carnivore community is that I don't know anything, that it's wrong and so on, that the serotonin hypothesis a myth, so on. Fine, perhaps. But from what we understand from science, that does not seem to be the case. 
that these seem to be key elements in the pathophysiology of sleep problems and non-sleep problems. So I'm going to go with that. Uh, and anecdotally here, I sleep much better when I backload carbohydrates at night and protein and leave fat off the table because fat is really hard to digest. And so your body is going to have to chew on that, so to speak, much longer into your sleep period, thus potentially leading to lower sleep quality. Um, so I think that element needs to be further clarified. What sort of strategies are more beneficial and less beneficial is the way I'll describe it to sleep ability and quality. But I think other elements are in play here too with the time-restricted eating and fasting. So that's where I get really interested from interventions for this disorder that currently has no treatments outside of pharmacological management. And so I've been studying kind of wake pathways, orexin specifically, in relation to time-restricted eating and intermittent fasting. And there seems to suggest that fasting of any duration upregulates wake biology and leads to increased energy, which makes a ton of sense, makes a ton of sense from a theory perspective. Because if you're not eating, if you don't have food and you're an organism and you need to survive, you could go to sleep, but you're probably going to go try and find some food, which means the body's going to go into more of a like war state, if you will. And so that's something that I'm really interested in exploring from the context of people who are experiencing excessive daytime sleepiness is, yeah, let's think about what you're eating, but maybe what if we ate less? What if we didn't eat as much? Because when we're eating so much in this state of oversaturation, well, the hedonistic world, like, I don't, I don't, there's no impetus to go out and hunt and to find a mate or whatever it may be. Let's just go sleep. So I think from a theory perspective, and now the science is starting to show it, these things matter. And I know I'm rambling, but I want to answer the meditation question too, because one of the first studies I jumped on when I was at the University of Arizona was looking mm -hmm. at meditation and sleep. And I was dumbfounded. Yes, I was a peon research assistant undergrad at that time. But basically, the results showed that meditators objectively slept worse. And yet their subjective responses were they slept better, and that they had more energy, and that their cognitive testing across the day was better, and so on and so forth. And so there may be aspects of meditation that address some things we acquire during sleep anyways, as well as the things you alluded to as far as being less stressed, so on and so forth, that could aid in the sleep. Again, maybe the six hours they got was better quality or denser yeah. sleep rather than seven and a half that somebody else gets, right? So it's not going to be one one variable per se that tells the whole story, but it was kind of paradoxical that we saw worse sleep objectively in meditators relative to health non-meditators can, can we just yeah, clarify can we just clarify worse sleep are you talking about less sleep or actual the quality of sleep was worse in terms of like eeg or was or things like this or, yeah we're talking about uh polysomnography measured macro okay. variables so we're not even okay. really talking about percentage of n3 sleep we're not talking about yeah. spectral analysis looking at kind of the amount of certain types of frequencies of waveforms yeah. during sleep. We're just talking about kind of sleep onset latency and more so WASO and sleep duration was that they had more WASO and lower sleep duration. So in turn, they also had lower sleep efficiency as well. Um, but yet they reported better sleep yeah. and generally the literature suggests they live longer lives and healthier lives. So what to make of that? Well, that will correlate then with some of the stuff you see in um, our psychology and philosophy as well. If you want to put meditation to a religious framework, that people who generally have a religious practice <clears throat> on average live five to 10 years longer than those that don't. And that's what Nietzsche said. God is dead. But he said, you have killed him, you idiots. People don't remember <laughs> the last part of what Nietzsche said, because Nietzsche goes on to describe that it'll be, this will be the problem. Anyway, that could be another 10 podcasts. I am conscious that we are coming towards the end of our time. So can we jump to the last paragraph of this paper, the last section, to summarize some of the strategies and interventions with sleep, to assist with sleep um, in these athletes, which could range from you know personal interventions to education and so on. So we might just finish up with this last part before we uh, wrap up this three-part um, series of three idiots. The three amigos, three episodes, three idiots. Three idiots. I like that one. And I've <clears> talked a lot. And honestly, I think this section in particular is better answered by Jonathan and you, Ian, because both of you work directly with athletes. I have not yet. And also have 
participated in this type of research. So I'll pass the microphone to Jonathan to get us kickstarted and, and maybe I'll open my mouth again soon. <laughs> uh, so essentially, uh, as I mentioned previously, it's important to know which, uh, which type of athlete you're working with. So a, a rookie, a sophomore, a full blown veteran, are you working for travel? What are you working with? Uh, and then you make the educa educational piece the core feature of everything. So you want them to know what sleep is and what sleep is not. So you want them to be able to prioritize sleep to the same extent they try to prioritize their gym time and their food time. So if they do prioritize sleep to the same level of gym and mental preparation for a game, you know that they're going to do just well with your sleep without over killing it. So now you always stretch that it's not about making it perfect. It's about optimizing everything you can with variables that are always under your control, such as sleep. So having said that, when they understand the point that you need to prioritize your sleep, then you go under the water of what type of sleeper you are. Important to know the chronotype or the, or the uh, circadian preference, if I may, uh, of your athlete. And following that then, depending on where they are uh, across the globe, you can stratify when they should go to bed, when they should avoid it. Then you go with the educational piece of the screen time. If I'm talking about a uh, Olympic uh, sport, when they do travel, they always have their PS5 with them because coach are telling them, please do not expend too much energy outside of the hotel, walking around, visiting, and so on and so forth. And then they're stuck in the hotel. What should they mm. do? Read a book? You know, they may do it for a day or two, but uh, for a uh, two weeks trip in Germany, Austria, and Sweden? No, they're going to have their PS5. So how do you approach this? So blue blocking glasses will be a good option for them, trying to minimize the time they are on their screen or when they are on their screen, making sure they're not playing while on bed uh, and so on and so forth. So to me, it, it's just a big wrap up of what we've discussed over the three episodes and making this a digestible educational piece for every of your athlete with always keeping in mind you're talking to an individual, not an actual team. You are talking to an individual within the team and they're all different. So the 24 of them, need your approach. The 24 of them need their standardized uh, information, of course, but they also need their little golden nugget so they can adjust along the way throughout their season, throughout their trip, throughout their weekend, throughout their off season, and so on and so forth. So I really believe that this is how flexible you can be with your recommendation and do not use these hardcore boundaries of you mm -hmm. shut your screen down two hours before bed. You don't do this. Now tell them what are the detriment, tell them how you can fix it and tell them what to do. And this has everything to do with the, the education and your cognitive flexibility that you all have with your uh, clinical intervention. I think they're great points, Jonathan. I think um, maybe using the inverse language, not being negative and positive is better as well. Uh, many people don't like getting told what to do. We saw that during COVID. And I think if we could have um, actually flipped the language that we use around, we might have had some better outcomes. You know, for example, with athletes or with any sort of public health or any sort of uh, health intervention, if we say to people, the best time for you to go to bed is between this and this, the best time for you to drink caffeine is here, the best time if you want to have a beer is here, if you want to play video games. So we flip that in a positive way. I think we get a lot more engagement from people as opposed to don't do this and don't do that. People just get brow browbeaten down. They just get pissed off of just listening. They just feel like they're constantly being told what not to do. So if we could use it in a positive sense, that would be really good as well. It's the same thing, just a different way of looking at it. The other thing I would say... Yeah, most, most definitely. I mean, you can hear my accent. Do, do you really think I'm not drinking red wine every now, and every, every now and then? So, of course, the alcohol will be a big piece of it. So a lot of our athletes, should I drink alcohol? And again, this is what I tell them. Look, I'm francophone my red wine is part of who i am i'm not throwing that away i'm just not drinking a bottle every night though i'm just not drinking a glass every night also there is time for it and you you schedule it it's always a question of when but again even though i'm drinking very moderately every time i'm having a glass i know that my following night will be disturbed and that the athlete needs also to know it if you want to go down that path 
no problem. Just know that the following night, that night specifically will not be as high quality as if you were not drinking. That needs to be understood. And if they get that, you're not telling them what to do or what not to do. You are educating them and yeah. that they prefer yeah. that approach. The cause and effect. It's like, it's just, it, it's, it is what it is. There's no magic way around these things. That's, that's the thing, you know? And I think you're right, educating people around that. The next part I would say is I think we actually have to start educating coaches and physiology and strength and conditioning and human performance staff probably even more so because some of these people are, you know, they've done an undergrad in exercise physiology and master's in strength and conditioning. There's not a big focus on recovery in these in these degrees. They might be quite young. They might have had that experience. And they might be just trolling through the internet, listening to podcasts, picking up kind of guff that they're giving to people. And I've heard some incorrect advice being given to people about stuff, you know, like, oh, yeah, you're better off you get people up in the morning, just get them training. It's like, no, you're better off like after a game, letting them sleep in. Or the classic one is, you know, you know, the best thing to do after a game is to get up and get like, you know, a cold water immersion. So you finish playing a game at 10, half 10 at night, you know, all this activity, all this sort of cortisol stimulation, caffeine after the game, some heat, maybe had a beer and it's like half two and people go to bed. And now you've got them up the next morning at half seven to go and get in the ocean. They've had like four hours of sleep. Like the ocean's not going to go from, you know, 20 degrees to 40 degrees during the day. They can go down and do that at 12 o'clock in the day. The temperature's not going to change that much, like maybe a one degree during the day or something like, you know, so it's, it's this kind of bizarre approach how people just listen to crap really and, um, and then just go over that as well. And that's the benefit of the internet. There's lots of information and that's the bad part about the internet. There's lots of information. We spoke about ChatGBT a few times. We just put a blog up on our um, website about ChatGBT. I don't know if you've seen this, but we, what we did was we actually took a few of our existing blogs and then we fact checked them in in ChatGBT, and by and large, ChatGBT got it wrong. So ChatGBT gave us the incorrect references when we asked them about sleep and tennis, for example. Um, it referenced papers that actually, when you went to the source paper, had no information in regards to that. So what ChatGBT is doing, it's not sitting there in a very intelligent manner, trawling through PubMed or any of these other databases. It's basically just scouring the internet. And then just pull them out. So if somebody has written a blog that's wrong or something else, it's getting a negative reinforcement cycle. So that's the difference. And that's why I was saying to people as well during the week, some people were asking me about this outside of the podcast and outside of work. I was like, it's like Wikipedia. Any old guff can go into it. And so if there's junk in, there's going to be junk out. So if you are getting a paragraph out of ChatGPT and it's got referencing, it might look like it's good, but don't believe it. That's like me saying to you, I could quote studies to you about the benefits of steroid use in, I don't know, 15-year-old boys in high school. And I could go, oh, yeah, well, Charest and Cook looked at this. And I could say those things. It might mean anything, but you, it sounds good. So you're just getting conned and you're getting conned by some of these things as well. I don't think ChatGBT is purpose, purposely doing it, but we just need to be careful about what we're listening to, what we're looking at, and not everybody is an expert in these areas. Just like I wouldn't go out and give advice on, I don't know, TRT use for men in their 40s because I don't know enough about it, right? So it's the same kind of thing as well. So we need to pick our sources correctly as well. So I think in the community, if I want to say that collectively about sleep and performance stuff in athletes, for us in the research or consulting community, it's not just about educating the athletes, it's about educating the physiologists and the exercise staff, but also ex and, and training the coaches as well, because some of the coaches have got this, like, it's like they got their whole um, exercise and science, uh, exercise science information from watching Rocky. It's just ridiculous. <laughs> right? Well, so and I think you're right. Yeah. I think you're right with ChatGPT. I think it is a um, perfect tool, but it, I think it will be very powerful soon enough but of course, you can find inaccurate information, such as it will be good for you running with a uh, weighted vest. So, for yeah. example, I know people that do run with, with weights on them, and they think it's good. I mean, it's there on ChatGPT. But again, we all know, 99% of us, that it's completely false, that you should never do it. It will wreck your knees and hips and ankle. But yet, you can find this information out there. He's referencing me. I often will run with a weighted vest um, and disregard, strike that from the record. There's a lot of good information out there that it might be a useful tool, but it might not be for everyone. And that goes back to what we're getting at here. You know, in the context of sport, oftentimes the 
the early interventions were based around sleep extension with Sherry Ma's work, uh, kind of the seminal uh, studies that showed how extending sleep a couple hours led to increased free throw percentage and shooting accuracy. And I think Stanford basketball players and, but generally speaking, we're often more in the kind of sleep education or sleep hygiene camp from what I've seen in the mm-hmm. literature when it comes to what's actually being delivered. And generally though, I don't think it's well studied empirically, but generally people teams are working with sleep and circadian professionals doing circadian based interventions to shift rhythms around with light exposure, melatonin use, things like that to potentially adapt to different time zones, but that's all going to be sport dependent. And as Jonathan's Mm -hmm. pointed out, as we've discussed over and over again, it needs to be individualized as well. And so that creates major complexity that there is going to be hard to distill in any sort of scientific study. Um, at the same time, it depends this time of year. Are they in a training season or a period? Are they in a com- competition period? If you're in a sport where you compete once every month versus three to four times a week, those things matter. As you two both astutely pointed out, more efforts from the coaches and the training staff, more education there and more impetus there. But it's also the organization's which I know Jonathan's paper on the National Basketball Association that I wasn't a part of, I not irritated you to invite me to collaborate, whatever. Actually, I don't think we knew each other at that point, but either way, um, you know- He's still guilty. There had, still guilty. Uh, he knew me, he knew of me. Uh, but anyways- Say um, my name, say my name. <laughs> <laughs> the National Basketball Association has integrated some of this information and reduced the number of back-to-back games and the D, uh, they've inhibited certain distance that can be traveled on a back-to-back game. So it's starting to slowly infiltrate into the organizational sphere. And I think that also is an area where things need to change. We have to give people opportunity to have proper, healthy sleep habits. Uh, and that starts with the amount of games they play the time they play the games and where they play the games. And then training can be also organized around that to provide an optimal sleep opportunity, if you will, and sleep behaviors and meal timing that coincides with that. But it's complicated. And the last thing I want to say is going back to like, it's not a linear, just apply clinical interventions to an athlete population. This is a really unique group of people. Uh, They have a lot of unique demands. Jonathan and I are really interested in student athletes because I think they actually have more unique demands than say professional athletes with less resources available to them. I'd agree. But if you're going to deal with somebody who has insomnia disorder, clinically significant insomnia, you're applying cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. One of the big low hanging fruits is to abolish daytime napping, to leverage that homeostatic drive for sleep to potentially reduce the difficulties with initiation and maintenance. However, in the athlete and performance space, structured strategic napping, tactical napping is a recommendation. So how to make sense of both in that context when you have an athlete who's struggling with insomnia characteristics, but also has to perform late at night. And so you're recommending a nap of a certain duration, maybe not longer than 60 minutes, but at the same time, that still may have the potential to negatively influence their sleep at night. It gets complicated. And so that's where I think we need to evolve is strategically developed interventions for this population, not just applying our clinical interventions in this population. Well said. Nice way to finish. Uh, gentlemen, thank you very much. We have done three great episodes looking at this paper. We could have done about maybe seven more. I think uh, for me, going through this, we would have... I think it's clear to see that we didn't go through, like you said, Jesse would like do steps one, two, three, and four and equals this. It's more complex than that. It's more nuanced than that. And um, for those of you listening that might feel a bit frustrated, uh, we feel equally frustrated as well. There's still lots to do in this area. We discussed on this podcast as well, lack of funding, um, lack of access to athletes, um, you know, all these other challenges is not to have a whinge, but, you know, many of us are not, um, you know, getting paid money to do this. Uh, in the case of myself, I'm self-funded and do have a passion. I know Jonathan does like clinical work as well and does research on the side. 
Jesse's finishing off his PhD and working as a clinical psych as well. So it's not like we're all just sitting around concentrating on athletes 24 seven. So, um, yeah, if anybody would like to fund us, um, <laughs> let us know. We will gra- gladly take some money. Uh, yeah, I, will, I will happily take money. Happily. Happily, take, happily take money, but I won't do that. Um, <laughs> but uh, Jesse, if people want to contact you, what's the best way to get in contact with you? Follow your work. What can do? How? What's your what's your handles as they say out there? What's your uh, what's your handles out there on the road? As I tell Jonathan, if you need to reach me, uh, don't uh, change your cognitive state and and think of something else. now. Um, you can find me, I think, most active on Twitter. It's at Sleep and Sports, as it's uh, as you would assume it is is written. So at Sleep and Sports, that's the best place to reach me. I'm pretty active there. And do you have a website, Jesse, or anything out there where you're communicating? Oh, any stuff? No, nah, I'm not that cool. Not yet. Okay. No, that's soon enough. Now, Jesse, you also host another podcast as well, correct? Oh, yeah. Shameless plug for the Sleep Research Society podcast. I do host that uh, so if you're not sick of me talking about sleep and circadian science at this juncture, and you can handle me talking more, I get to have the privilege of about hour, hour and a half long interviews on the latest hot uh, science that comes through sleep or sleep advances the journals. Yeah, the hot sizzle. The sizzle. <laughs> the sleep sizzle. There's an name for a podcast. Jonathan, you could start that one. Uh, hello, it's the sleep sizzle with George St. Pierre and Jonathan Charest. How are you? I am a francophone. I drink wine. I'm not an alcoholic. I'll punch your face. Yeah, that's really much it. Okay. <laughs> that's all you need to know. <laughs> John, how, can people, how can people find you? How can people find so, you on the webs? Uh, equally, so on Twitter, you can, uh, so it's at Joe Share one so the number, uh, and easily reachable also on Center for Sleep and Human Performance. Uh, this is the website. This is the clinic where I I, I work, uh, and yeah, these will be your best uh, bet to actually have a hold of me if you want to discuss with a French accent. Okay, and you should book in a consultation very quickly because Jonathan has recently got his French passport and be moving back to the motherland. <laughs> so, you know, see, uh, like most Quebecois people, they don't want to be part of Canada, so most of them are getting a French passport to go back to France. So, um, we wish you all the best in your journey, Jonathan. <laughs> thank you <laughs> uh, we will put all that in the show notes as well um, for those French people worry about Jonathan coming back I know you've got some good immigration policies so you can kick him back out straight away uh, we will also put the link to the paper we've been discussing into the show notes as well and uh, yeah reach out to us if you have any questions any queries and um, I'm sure we'll do this again gentlemen thank you very much it's been it's been great fun and uh, I really enjoyed it so thank you very much for your time very appreciative of it Thank you, and it's been a true pleasure. Thank you, listeners.